Hey, it's Travis Lane Jenkins. Welcome to episode 102 of the Entrepreneur's Radio Show, a production of rockstarentrepreneurnetwork.com. Today, I'm going to introduce you to Chris Weiser. Now, Chris is a rock star entrepreneur for several reasons. He's built multiple businesses to some pretty serious levels. Also, he's lived through some pretty tough times and experienced an employee embezzling a huge amount of money from him, and he turned that into a lesson that helped him find success further down the line, and he's actually going to talk about that today in our episode, along with a whole host of other other things. He's going to talk about multiple streams of income, really just kind of a wide range of things. So I've got a great interview for you, as always. Uh, now, one of the things I really like about this is Chris is really candid about his path to success, which I love because it, I believe it's that candor that can help you steer around some of these pitfalls in your journey as an entrepreneur also. Now, before we get started, I want to ask you to hang around with me until the very end because I want to talk to you about a common problem, which is fear, something that all of us deal with. Also, I want to take a minute and say thank you to Patch Abilities for writing a review on Stitcher. Uh, we're just starting to get a little traction on Stitcher. And uh, Patch Abilities, thank you for that five-star review and the wonderful title that says Oceans of Priceless Tips. I don't know if you listened to the last episode, but for those of you that missed it, I challenge you to find something that you've been putting off and make a commitment to move it forward. Patchabilities, ironically, also called in and told me what it was that uh, she's been putting off and she made a commitment to move forward with it. And so Patchabilities, I have to commend you. Even though you're a full-time mom with two little boys at home, you still find time to continue your education for business with this show and other shows, I'm sure. And also clearly outline what you've been putting off along with what actions you're going to take to move forward. And that's exactly how you accomplish high levels of success is by taking little bitty steps each and every day, even when you don't want to. A lot of people think that incredible levels of success are a series of gigantic steps, and that's not true. A lot of times it's a series of little bitty steps that lead to gigantic successes. So I want to I want to commend you on that for taking the time to write the review. That really means a lot to me. And also calling in and telling me and being so candid with me with what's holding you back. Now for... Everybody else listening, uh, I would really appreciate it if you take the time and go to iTunes or Stitcher uh, through the links that we've provided on the show and write a review. What that does is that helps us reach more entrepreneurs like yourself by giving us more exposure on those networks. Uh, one last thing, before we get started, I want to remind you also that there's three ways that you can take the interviews with you on the go which is through iTunes, Stitcher, or Android. Although all of them have poor search functions, so just go to rockstarentrepreneurnetwork.com, click on the iTunes, Stitcher, or Android button, whichever one works best for you on whichever platform you use, on the menu bar, and it will take you directly to the podcast where you can subscribe to the show there. And while you're there, if you'd write a review, I'd really appreciate it. So now that we've got all of that stuff out of the way, re remember to hang around with me until the very end. Let's go ahead and get down to business. Chris, welcome to the show. All right. Thank you, sir. How are you doing today? I'm excellent. Do you have your script out? <laughs> we were just... What's a script? What's a script? You know what that is. Yeah, we were just having a laugh about that, you know, because it's we prefer to do this in kind of a more of a casual, laid-back conversation than following a script. Although, you know, doing kind of a jazz improvisational conversation... Yeah, you really got to know your stuff cold. You got to know your business and everything that you talk about pretty deep, right? 
Yeah, I think it's what you actually hit a really good point there. It's making sure that you understand the theories of what you're talking about, because if you're going to BS with anything, you better have, and I say BS in an affectionate term, if you're going to talk intellectually about anything, you better have, number one, knowledge, but number two, passion. And right. You better understand what you're talking about, and, 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 and I think that's the same with, with music. I know you, we were talking a little music earlier. All those together. If you're going to improvise on anything, you better know your gig. Yeah, you you got to know what you're doing. Hey, so one of the things I like to do is, <clears throat> I, I know that you've built a couple of businesses, and I, I like to get the backstory. In in I, I think some people feel like that's boring. Although I, the reason why I do it beyond just getting to know you on a deeper level and introducing you to my people is I I feel like it's illustrative. It people can see their own life, their own ch- trajectory, whatever it is in your story, and uh, impose themselves in there. So does, do you mind giving us that backstory of how you got started no, and what the turning point was for you? Yeah, that's, uh, it's actually, I, I don't know that mine is essentially super boring, because it's not like I just had this meteor, uh, meteoric, right. uh, however you say that word, meteoric, rise right, right. to uh, super, super stardom. I'm not even a super stardom or anything close to that right now. But it's been it's been such a gradual, all over the place road to success. And you know we are definitely successful, and we're debt free, and we have a lot of things that are exciting and fun. And I feel very wealthy in my life. I'm not I'm not ridiculously rich. I don't see it that way. But I define wealth as being able to do the things you want whenever you want. That's what's in, that to me is wealth. You know, I, I right. have a lot of people that I know that own companies that have a ton more money than me that are stuck behind a desk or stapled to their company. And that's, that's not very wealthy in that world. Right. So I, I started out as a one man show. Really. I, uh, I had a computer company, uh, started out working at another IT. Actually, I was working at an internet provider, uh, right out of high school, um, at a dial up internet provider. And if you think about the infancy of the internet, right. that couldn't be, that couldn't be any more infancy. <laughs> and, uh, I was, I, I'd always kind of had this, uh, you know, what I know now is a pers- is a leadership personality profile to where I've been kind of visionary, uh, improvising, you know, building things on the fly, flying by the seat of my pants at times. I've always had that. And, you know, I, it's funny. I looked all the way back to when I was like in fifth, sixth grade and I had that mentality. But I kind of started out there, ran into some troubles, had my own computer company for a while. Uh, and had an employee embezzle a lot of money from me, like near a hundred grand, a lot of money. Oh no! And and that while that seemed like the worst thing ever, it pointed me on the path to where I am now, and uh, it put me back to a, a place of how the hell am I going to survive? You know, what am I going to do for town? I got to get out of the retail world. I had all these things that were going through in my life, and this goes back to two thousand four, two thousand five. Mm. Uh, so we're talking 10 years, 10 years ago, basically now. Right. And it kind of pushed me down the, I'm going to be, you know, to get back on my feet, I had to rely on the one thing I could count on because I didn't have any money and I didn't have any people and I had my family. That's all I really had. But, uh, basically the, the lack of money caused, I was married at the time, pretty much caused my marriage to end. And I was on my own and I, you know, I had my parents and my brother and we kind of, forged ahead, but I relied on the one thing that I could rely on, which was myself, and started out as a business computer consultant. I was doing medical, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I was doing medical IT support just as a standalone guy and started to build the company, started to get a couple people, and I'm not going to, you know, I, I think the diff- one of the biggest differences between people that are successful and the people that and, and I don't even want to say successful because there's so many people that work for somebody else that are successful, but we're, not, we're, we're talking entrepreneurship successful. So the big difference between somebody that's going to be successful is you have to be a risk taker and you have to be willing to not be satisfied with what you're working on and what you're with. Right. So for me, I was actually doing pretty well as a standalone IT guy. I was making back in 2004, 2005, 2006, um, I think 06 is when I really started the basis of what I have now. I was making $65,000, $70,000 a year as a guy. And, you know, for the most part, that's a pretty good wage. It's not bad. And, but I just, I didn't feel fulfilled personally. And I, I always knew there was more there and there was more things I can grab. So it was a, a strive to how can I be different? How can we be better? And, and that's where 
kind of the model that we're in now evolved into. Uh, merged with another firm in 2008. Ended up buying uh, my partner out in uh, basically 2011, early 2011, 2012. Um, and since then, I've been a standalone owner. And since I bought, basically since I put the plan in motion to buy him, uh, we've basically grown about 650%. Not and too shabby. It's, uh, no, it's been it's been really a lot of fun, and, and a lot of that was this guy's a super good guy. I have nothing negative to say about him at all, but the problem was that he was completely not a risk taker. He was right. 100% comfortable in his world. He was comfortable making what he was making, and he was he was the wrong guy to actually be an entrepreneur or to be a, a business owner because if you're going to be a business owner with a small business and if you're satisfied with everything you're doing, you'll never even stumble onto the next product right. because – you know, every single day, I had a conversation last night with some people from Los Angeles and Las Vegas about a brand new product we're getting to launch four months from now that, that is a brand new thing in the industry. And that kind of thing never would have happened in my former partner's world. And I was so handcuffed by his unwillingness to take a risk that as soon as he was gone and I had immediate control, it was like, boom, the, the doors opened and... We moved forward, and uh, first thing I did was hire a sales guy. Right, and uh, that is that is absolutely huge because you know while I'm pretty good at it, I'm only one guy. Right, and uh, that was the first thing I did, and we've and we've skyrocketed since then. So, so that highlights something, and maybe that answers <clears throat> an observation of mine. And I, I want to throw you throw my observation at you, okay? Mm-hmm. So, so techie type things uh and uh whether it's a computer tech uh attorneys uh, which is not necessarily tech but very education based strict format doctors accountants all of those people are normally left brainers in your business the it thing is a left brainer thing uh and so you sound like a right brainer and i think the person the person that you partner with was definitely a left brainer because left brainers yeah. are are yeah. not risk takers. And so, number one, that's the problem is is you guys can't move at you can't get on the same page. So, am I correct? Are you a, are you a right brainer first, and you've developed some left brainer skills? Or, and are you familiar with that? Yeah, I don't I don't work in that world so much, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And the answer to your question is absolutely yes. You know, I I think you grow up you grow up with who you are, you know, your personality develops. I I think part of it is, you know, the, the culture you were brought into and also, you know, then you kind of develop your own little things and your nuances as you go on. But I've absolutely been a risk taker my entire life. I learned how to be a technician. And while I'm actually a pretty good computer tech, I still am to this day, probably I don't do a lot of it, but um, occasionally I have to dip my hands in the, in the, the tech pot just to help out and make sure that things are going right. But um, I think you're spot on with that. And right. uh, we were talking earlier on our pre-call that um, about personality profiles. We actually personality profile everybody in, in my current environments. Uh, we use the DISC test, D-I-S-C. Yeah, so instead I'm, of looking at it from le- no. left brain and right brain, we look at it from personality types. Yeah, before it's, you, very, it's, almost, it's almost identical. Yeah. Right. Before you say, I want to guess what you are. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm yeah. familiar with the disc, I've taken the disc also, and and I have a suspicion that you are a high D and a high I. Spot on, hundred percent D, hundred percent I. Yep. A very low compliance, <laughs> and uh, for those of you that are listening that don't really know what the disc is, it's uh, dominance, influence, steadiness, and compliance. And uh, I'm a hundred percent D, a hundred percent I which is literally entrepreneurs and leaders to a T. <laughs> right. um, and, that, and then there's, you know, and, and to give you a good example of that, I hired a new sales assistant. She just started two days ago on Monday for, you know, to work on our sales team. And one of our, recommend, our requirements is that she has to be a high SC. So he has, she has to be very steady and she has to be very compliant. And if you think about that, do you want a dominant assistant never right <laughs> because but you do want but you do want a compliant assistant so that's kind of the world we work in now versus uh, and obviously Travis you're familiar with the the disc test as well but it's just 
it's a little bit more defining than right brain, left brain. That's, that's kind of why we did it. Right. Yeah, and it definitely makes sense. So, I, and of course, <laughs> I'm sure you can probably guess I'm a high D and a high I also. <laughs> yep, I can, I can tell just like, and, and some of us get along. Uh, but some of us fight for control, right. uh, depending on you know who you are and uh, who you are from a personality standpoint. We are in a we're kind of in a peer relationship right now, and you're moderating. I'm working with you, so we get along really well. But uh, and and what's t- what's difficult in the in the DI world is that if you get two DIs that are at the same level and, and are fighting for the same space, it's not going to be a pretty <laughs> result usually. It's so, not productive. But, uh, it's all about right. picking, picking your battles. It, exactly. Exactly. You know, you you spend you spend more time doing things laterally, rather than getting uh, focused on the task at hand and moving forward. And so, the, you know, it, it's great that you mentioned that because that's one of the key problems that I see in businesses, is they have the uh, the wrong people in the wrong seats, and so everybody's yep, busy that's... pulling against each other rather than working together. Yep, and that's exactly why we've implemented it here. I learned it at a training center that I'm a part of, and I actually speak at the training center uh, just about every month now. And um, one of the one of the real and this goes back three years now that that we really learned that. And you're spot on. If you have the wrong people, you can have the absolute right people for your organization in the wrong seats, and you will stifle somebody's creative ability or even success at that position. So it's really important. And we disc every single pe- every single person in our environment is disc. Cool. Cool. Good stuff. And so now the trajectory of the of this first business, you started another business beyond this one, correct? I have, I, I'm a part of like five, <laughs> to give you an idea. Uh, okay. um, and I'm consulting and working up. But we have, uh, basically we have one corporate entity and then we have a couple divisions under it. So we actually have two and a half full companies under one corporate entity uh, from a billing standpoint. It's just easier to bill right, right. Uh, and, and, easy, and easier to have a tax-facing entity with one of those. But I have two and a half. Uh, the half one is just about ready for launch. Um, and then uh, we have people working and staff working on it now. It's just not launched yet. But then I have uh, three other ones that I am consulting on on a regular basis as well. Yeah, and so then as those scale, will you uh, incorporate those so that you can limit liability between those? Uh, probably. It kind of depends on how they go. Um, right now, uh, the, the three that are directly that I'm 100% owner of, which is the other two and a half that I should say now, it's going to be three shortly. But the two and a half that I'm directly owner of, they will be, that'll all be under my umbrella and I'll be here. Uh, whereas I'm, I'm a part owner and part consultant on a couple, three other uh, interests. And I'm I'm more looking at one of the big things that I've kind of taken away from research and learning and evolving and listening to shows like this um, is one of the, one of the biggest rules that the most successful people in the world have is they have multiple, multiple streams of income. Right. So that's, you know, a lot of people say, how do you have time for all this stuff? Well, I'm looking to make, make multiple streams of income for myself, not necessarily right now. I mean, that's great and it's fantastic, but it's looking one to two to three to five to 10 years down the road of having some type of a reoccurring, revenue stream that I can count on that keeps coming in. You know, I'm 37 years old at 50. I would, you know, do I want to retire? Where do I want to go? Um, that's 13 years from now. So it's thinking about things like that and making sure that I have multiple pieces and I don't want to be dependent on a one trick pony that I got to constantly babysit. And, and one of the things that I'm been really good at in my company, my main companies that I work in now every day And one of my things that I tell my, all my staff is let's master the strategy and delegate the execution. So let's, let's really build a process. Let's really build a system. And then we can plug people in because we have a chocolate cake recipe that they can learn. And that just lessens your time to spin up on new people. And it just makes it a lot more pro and it makes it so Chris doesn't have to babysit. Yeah. So, so where did you get this ac- business acumen at? Because a lot of people spend years and years uh, knee deep working in their business rather than on your business. And it sounds to me like you've made a shift to where you try to work predominantly on your business rather than in it. So where did that acumen come from? Majority of it came from, I actually have uh, two people in my life that I, uh, one is my direct business coach. I, sh- I should say actually three people. One is my direct business coach. Her name is Robin Robbins. She is a uh, mentor to basically a mentor to IT professional or IT professional business owners. 
And she's somebody that has a five or six million dollar a year company with five employees. And her, you know, her whole job is to be a business coach to celebrity experts like myself. Um, and so I, I've taken a lot from there. I've been her understudy for eight years now. So oh, starting in my late twenties. Yeah. And that's, so that's been going. I also have a guy, a friend of mine, a good friend of mine now named Alex Rogers. Uh, he owns a big IT firm and the training center that we were talking about earlier in California. And he built, he was a one man show like myself and now has two $15, $15 million a year monsters that he's working on. Um, and he basically, uh, I, I've learned so much from that guy and you know, you can't ever be afraid to learn and evolve and nobody knows everything. And I'm constantly, you know, best way that I learned is to make mistakes. I had an employee that I was talking with a couple of weeks ago that just, you know, he was upset about something and his, his response to me was, you can't make mistakes. You're the CEO. You're supposed to be better than everybody here. And my thing game was, I make more mistakes than everybody here because that's, that's really my job. You know, I'm, I'm not here to be a, an idiot and make stupid mistakes, but you have to take risk and you have to evolve and you have to build. And right. you see that picture of success all the time. And it's always that curvy, curvy road. It's never, it's never that 45 degree angle. Right. You know, you get, you get the freaks like Facebook and the freaks like WhatsApp and, you know, the, get guys that you know stuff like that happens and i think those are far more the exception not the rule well you know so what, what's interesting is you were wise enough to invest in yourself and in whether uh, with a mentor and in, in learning and growing and so entrepreneurship entrepreneurship is a lifelong career right it's a it's an evolution right and absolutely and so what's interesting to give you some outside perspective okay What's interesting about your trajectory and your journey is, is you're five to eight years beyond where, maybe even 10 years beyond where the natural entrepreneur would be if if you hadn't taken the time and spent the money to grow your knowledge and your experience. And so I, I, I want to tell you that. Now, I, I don't know if you share uh, any of your revenue, but uh, if you do, how big have you built your tech squad? Do you share that information? Uh, yeah, it's, it's okay. I mean, we went from, you know, to give you an idea, you know, we're not, we're not an immensely huge company. Uh, and first of all, I, I appreciate the feedback because that's really good to hear because if, if I wouldn't have, and I firmly believe that if I would not have invested in, and I, you're spot on what you're calling it is investing in myself and is investing in my tools mm -hmm. and my, my kits and training. If I wouldn't have done that, I'd be my former partner, honestly. Right. You know, I was not as nearly as analytical as him. And he was blatantly against, like, every month we'd sit down, he's like, cut this damn expense out. I'm like, I'm not cutting that out. If I got and, and there was, I think during our final negotiation phase, while he was still a partner in the company, I ended up paying for my membership to my business coach personally. That's right. how important it was to me because instead of it coming out of the firm, uh, I did that. But um, to give everybody an idea, I went from a one-man show in 2008, basically. I was still a one-man show with a help desk guy. Uh, when we merged with Dave, uh, that's my former partner, uh, we were about 340000 annually. Mm -hmm. um, and this year, we will, we're, we will be breaking $3 million this year. Nice. So you know, we've come. Again, it's not, it's not a huge deal, but um, I, I'm, what, what is exciting is in 2012, we broke a million. Wow. And in, yeah, so we're, we're massively escalating now and it's starting to come in a much quicker fashion. And, uh, that's really, you know, I'm, I'm still not content and that's kind of where some of this, and it's not a money hungry thing. A lot of people, you know, if they don't understand this, it's not, it's not about make who, how much money can I make or how much money can I take home? It's a, I know I can do better thing. I think it's it's not a whole lot different than, you know, you look at an NFL quarterback and if they win 14 games in a season, certain people wouldn't be like, hey, you had a great season. Well, no, I didn't win the Super Bowl. That's, you know, it's, and, it's, and it's hard to, I don't know how to relate to, and, and some of us that are entrepreneurs really get that. For the most people, I think, for the most well, part, everybody that's listening to this show probably will get it, but it's yeah, a lot of the laymen, a lot of the laymen don't. Yeah, well, well, it's an accomplishment thing, Chris. And so, you know, your your work is never done. So even early on, you said you you don't feel like you feel like you're super successful. Well, super successful is is like tomorrow; it never comes. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know, exactly. be- because what happens is 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 as you achieve new plateau levels, your your horizons broaden and your awareness mm-hmm. broadens and your potential broadens everything your universe is constantly expanding and so that's yep. why it's it's kind of a chasing thing and so i think also as entrepreneurs we're afraid to pat ourselves on the back for fear of putting out the burning desire fire that's in our belly right you know yeah and, and you know what, what what i've run into is something that i did not expect at all i've never expected this um one of my, and I, I forgot to mention my third influence of my, my business coaching is, uh, who's now also a good friend of mine is Nick Manton. I'm not sure if you've heard of Nick Manton. No, I haven't. He's, uh, he's, con- he's considered the celebrity brand expert on the internet. So one of his things is to work with entrepreneurs like myself and like you, um, and he helps you develop your own celebrity expert brand. Uh, so something Nick helped me with is to write my own bestseller. Um, I had a bestselling hardcover book that I was on. We're working on another one right now. Uh, he helped me. Uh, direct and produce um, a documentary that was on Biography Channel uh, in fall. And, you know, he's really helped me to learn to take it to the next level. And, man, what if we could only know what we, what we know now and rewind? I was telling my wife this yesterday. We were actually driving to the doctor yesterday together. We go to a health doctor. Uh, my dad had a heart attack not that long ago, so I, one of the things I've been trying to do is make sure that I'm healthy. It's a, it's a scary deal when you go through. It's kind of a wake up call, right? Right. But I was telling my wife, man, if only I could know these. You know, we were. I forget what we were talking about, but if only I could know this stuff that I know now. If I could rewind and go back five years and and have all this knowledge and information. And you're right on. It's like an awakening, and it's just stuff that you're constantly evolving in and learning. And I have so much passion for doing what I do and and it's not it has nothing to do with technology really it, it has to do with and that's what's fun about working on the company is you move past being an IT guy into being a real entrepreneur where you're working on the company and I could take anything now I don't care what it is I could take any product that that's out there that I have belief in and passion in and we could put the same marketing and sales plan behind it and we could launch it and be successful right, right. and that's what's cool it's, now, is that the vein you started down the path? You said there was something that you didn't see, uh, you didn't see coming in. What what was that vein that you were going down there? It sounded like there was. Yeah, I, I forget what it was. I, I that's why I don't remember. Oh well, was well that's fine. I was sitting. Yeah, it was also. I was sitting in the. I was literally driving with my wife in the car. I should. It's actually off topic, but pretty comical. And it just shows how technology oriented we are now. She's sitting there next to me talking, and I couldn't hear her right, so I, I pressed the volume up key on my steering wheel like four times. And she's like, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "Oh, uh, yeah, you're never going to believe what I just did." <laughs> it was pretty funny. It was pretty. It just uh, I was like, "Oh my god!" I do the same but, thing. Uh, sometimes, I, sometimes yeah. I hit. I I'm a big TiVo user, and sometimes I I want to reach over and do the the you know the five, the 15 second rewind. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I missed yeah. that. Rewind yeah, that. This is pretty funny. So, yeah, I don't remember exactly what I was saying, but we were or what we were what we were talking about. But there was something in 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 the day that I was just like, man, I wish right. I could take the knowledge I have now and rewind and you know know all those things I know now. And yeah. Well, you just, know, I. I if if you sorry. ever uh, sorry about that, there's a little bit of lag on the call, so so an uh, unintentional stepping on you there. The uh, if you were to chart it out on a, uh, there were a couple of things that that really made a big difference for me that made me have just a voracious appetite for learning and growing, and and so the someone had laid it out on a chart, an event that I was at and and he showed how one little key piece of in, information or paradigm shift in your way of thinking, he showed the impact that it can have on the, the growth traject, trajectory and income trajectory of your life over the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. Right. And, yep, yep, I get what you're saying. And that really blew my mind. And what that did for me is that made me do a better job of reading every book thoroughly because I used to be guilty of reading a book and feeling like I got halfway through it and understood where they were going and I'd quit reading it. And and so I there 
from that point forward, I, I stuck with every book just in case that nugget of wisdom or that paradigm shift was somewhere deeper in the book, right? And and so yep. there was this accum- accumulation of knowledge that built up over time. And then another thing that had a major impact on me that that hit me like a ton of bricks and, and it offended me on some levels is the guy defined – uh, clarified the definition of average. And he said, Travis, if you're average, you're either the best of the worst or you're the worst of the best. And I hate that. <laughs> I don't want to be either one of those, right? <laughs> I don't yeah, want to be I, either I one of those. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I've always sought to be, you can't be the best at everything, but there are things that are your specialty that uh, are my specialty that I set out to be one of the best at. And those were some of the things that, uh, one of the many things that had kind of a paradigm shift in, in, uh, my su- success trajectory and, uh, over the last several years. Uh, I wanted to segue back to uh, some of the other things that you were doing uh, so that we're not speaking in too esoteric terms. One of the things that uh, you were doing is a full-service MSP marketing and appointment setting. And so so go deeper on that. Explain to me what that is. Sure. Um, Well, one of the things, you know, kind of what you were just talking about there, I have – I'd say I have a couple pieces that I really figured out the biggest of which is that whole chocolate cake recipe thing. Mm -hmm. That's probably the most important thing that I've, that I've done. And that led into uh, where, and and what MSP means for the average public, it has nothing to do with anything but technology. Um, The the group that we're all kind of channeled into as what tech squad IT is, is we're considered a managed service provider. So we provide a flat rate of services for clients for a flat amount of money and it's kind of, you know, it's what we're called. It's very similar to a general contractor or, or you know, it's a, it's a marketing term. It's a business, a business term for our group. Right. Um, and one of the other things that I found success with is that there's riches and niches. Mm-hmm. I, I remember my, my business coach telling me this multiple times. And it's, so what she's done is she built a multi-million dollar business coaching empire off of only marketing to technology professionals. That's the only people she goes, that's the only marketing, the only group she sells to is MSP uh, clients. And she's got about 5,000 monthly clients that pay her a recurring revenue stream. And the only people she markets to, there's other people that come in and say, hey, I want you to market my shoes. And she says, no, I don't want to do that because that's out of my scope and it's out of my niche. And I, I really look at that and I really look at that carefully well, we started actually having, we built a process, a chocolate cake recipe here internally at Tech Squad. This goes back about four years to where we actually had our own telesales team. And we started getting so good at it. And when I say telesales, it's actually, I have people that many people would consider inside sales people, but they're technically outbound, outbound telesales or telemarketing piece, people that sit here in our office. Right. And they were, they were smiling and dialing. And I don't care what product I'm going to be launching from here out. I will have a telesales team backing it from now on in my entire life. I don't care what it is because the best way that you can get the market, the word out is to do that. But we got so good at it and doing it internally that I had these people were booking more appointments than I could actually fill. And it became uh, the problem on the, on the company side became how do we scale properly to actually get enough service support people to what we can fulfill everything that sales is selling. Hmm. Well, instead of getting rid of those people, we had some extra capacity. So we started reselling their services and we started reselling it to other technology companies around the nation. <laughs> so that's kind of that's kind of where that came into play. So now we have and that's business number two is we have a recurring revenue stream for companies that call us or basically there are clients of ours. We outbound call probably some of the call. Some of the people that are listening to this show today is we call in and an outbound call as that company into them, but we only do this for technology firms. And we've developed a damn good little side business doing it. And it's, I shouldn't even say it's a side business because now it's, it's, you know, it's underneath Tech Squad's corporate ladder, but it's, I'm employing, you know, 10 plus people, I think 15 people in, in, the, in our back room, 
and all they're doing is building that system. Well, you know, I've got experience in that, and that's one of the things that that jumped out at me is. Uh, well, before I go into that, is is it in the same vertical that you're in? Are the services that you are selling yep. in the same vertical you're in? It is. Yep, it's exactly this. So, so the clients that we are calling on behalf of are identical to our company around the nation. Oh, too funny. So exa- exactly, exactly the same vertical. It's and then that goes back to the riches and niches thing. So we took the the chocolate cake recipe plus the niche. And then we basically, you know, I built a system for acquisition. So we have an inside salesperson for that. We have an inside dialer just for that. And I honestly can't, I can't sell. We're selling so much on that right now. We were struggling to fulfill on that too. The only problem I have with the product is it's very hard to scale. It's not hard to scale, but you know, it's, it's seats and uh, people in seats, basically butts and seats. That is the difficulty of scale, which it happened. You know, that is there. hard. That is hard to scale because you know you've got to have uh, the technology, the dialers, the room, the manager. Uh, you know, all, all of those things. Uh, I used to have uh, predictive dialers, and mm-hmm. and uh, and we the amount of calls we could go through every night was incredible, insane. With uh, I think twelve or fifteen people on the phone. And, uh, and so it's a management challenge or it can be a management challenge. So what's your, uh, what's your lead setting rate? Is it hovering right around 10%? Uh, we're actually, and this is where it's the riches and niches I think is really valuable. And we've actually taken this a whole nother level. So we're at like 22% right now. Nice. Um, and we are now also calling the MSP vendors on behalf of the MSP vendors. So we're going into places like, you know, our, our, if you know what Salesforce is, I think everybody knows what Salesforce is. Mm -hmm. We have a specific product for the MSP world called ConnectWise. We're calling on behalf of people like ConnectWise into the MSPs and booking appointments for them for the same exact rate that we would book for the normal end user MSP client. And but here's the key, and you're hitting this right on the head, and I, I love the experience because you're hitting it right on the head. So we're 22% to the end user. We're 49% appointment set to the specific market. <laughs> so it's, it's a couple really, really good business lessons because you know the, the whole point is if you're going uh, B2C, business to consumer, you're going to be, you know, that's where your 10% or lower comes in. If you go business to business, you're going to be about 20%, you know, maybe 10% to 20%. But what we're doing is we're going vendor to business and we're up in the 40, 40 to 50% range. Nice. And I think there's, there's some tremendous value to be said from just those numbers alone. And it's, it's really changed my entire impression of the whole deal. And it makes you see that you're, you know, as you move around in business, where you want to choose your next battle. So, so basically, would that be a lead aggregator or what? You know, would that qualify as lead uh, I, aggregation? Or? Yeah, I'd, I'd call it that probably. I mean, it's uh, the whole. Uh, yeah, I, I would probably call it that. That's a good term for. I've never heard of that, but it definitely is a. a you know, we just call it lead generation. Here, okay. But uh, yeah, and, I, I would I would say I would say that's a pretty good call, name for it. And so you're mon- you're you're making money off of that at uh, you know so through arbitrage so so maybe it cost you ten dollars to generate you know total landed cost it cost you ten dollars to generate that lead and and you're getting fifty dollars or or something like that yeah, is that yep, the exactly. yep. that's how you're monetizing okay good yeah uh, we're we're a little we're a little bit different um, but the bottom line is I have you know it's it's most of it's just a math problem and it's not put together too crazy. Um, but you're very close to how we do it. You know, we have, what is kind of neat is, uh, and it's all about predictability. That's, that's the only difficulty that took us a little while to get there is the more you can predict what your income is going to be, which is that recurring revenue stream that you're bringing into your company, the more you can control what you charge and the more you can change what you charge. Um, but if you can't control your performance or your output, then you are sitting there kind of like, uh, what do I do? What do I do? You know, that's, that's where those numbers and that math problem becomes really important. So that's kind of where we've been moving around to find exactly what we can control mm-hmm. and the controllability of a 50% appointment. So for every 10 calls we're making for the vendor to business model, we're booking five appointments. Well, I can make plans on that. Big, yes. yeah. big time plan, big time plans on that because versus that 10% model. And I think we all know marketing as a whole 
is kind of a crapshoot. You know, there's people that win awards for a 5% direct mail response rate. You know, that's, that's stuff that's, you know, you, while you can do that, the cost is expensive and it's hard to predict. But if I can, if I can go into anything with a 50% success rate in marketing, and come out with something, I'm, I'm going to be in really, really good shape. Well, yeah, you can build a sales team based on that, right? Uh, Ab- absolutely. Uh, you know, the only two things that are that are uh, scary about that model is all business models have a maturity rate, a maturation cycle, right? You know, yep. Where, yep. where a bunch of competition comes in and the market gets flooded. And then also legislate, legislation can shut those things down overnight. And so I've seen businesses that were doing uh, B to C uh, dialing that, you know, were shut down overnight, or I've seen it, you know, there used to be a business in, in l- creating leads over faxes and they shut that down. Right. And so, yeah, yeah that's more on the, that's, that's more on the consumer side though. Right. And, that's, and we've stayed a hundred percent away from that. So we don't, you know, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. It's just a matter of, we don't, we don't even deal with that. We don't even call them. Don't deal with anything on the consumers. Because I, I really do. I, you're right on with that because I totally I feel bad for the people that were B to C, got, and then the no call list shows up, and then what do you do? <laughs> They're out of business. I mean, we're talking about big businesses yep. that were making tons of money, and tomorrow, you know, the next day they're out of business. Uh, so it's so it's just crazy, but you know, less likely. Whenever you got it nichified like that, the likelihood of legislation ever getting you is uh, slim to none. Uh, because it, yeah, I, yeah, I think I, you're I, actually I fulfilling a need rather than uh, causing uh, causing yep. a problem, right? Yeah, I think you and I got to hang out. We're like on the same page. We're on the same page and just about everything. <laughs> right, right. Hey, uh, listen, we're. I don't want to run too long. I know you've got a lot of things going on. Let's uh, let's segue into the lightning round. I sent you three questions over. Are you are you prepared for this? I did not even read them because I did. I, that's by design. Well, cool. <laughs> cool. I, didn't want, I, can, I can look at them real quick. If you no, want no, 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 no. Don't I worry do about have it. Them and I haven't sitting. No, I'm going to serve them okay. up to you, and you just, uh, you know, this is. We already agreed. This is a form of jazz, so you know, you just yep. answer whatever is authentic for you. So, what book or program made an impact on you related to business that you'd recommend, and why? Well, that is uh, that's actually a really good question. Um, so I know uh, what I will say is my that constant reinvesting of myself uh, or reinvesting in myself and making sure that I was constantly learning and constantly evolving that the business coach model that I had before not being afraid to take knowledge from other people um, I, I think that's that's probably you know it, that's not necessarily a piece of technology or anything like that but it's definitely related to evolving yourself and building it, you know, and, and there's tons of books out there. I know, I know one specific piece and, and what's funny is my wife actually taught me this and I made fun of her when she originally handed me the secret, the book, the secret. And I think we all know that. Mm-hmm. And a little bit, some of it's a little bit hokey. I get that. And people will struggle, but that power of positive thinking mentality is so very valuable. Um, and I see, I, I've seen certain people in my world and in my life, just have this constant belief that they are going to fail. Right. And if you believe that, I don't care how hard you try and succeed, you're going to fail. Right. And there's a lot to be said for so she so she handed me that book. Actually I think she had the D V D and it was audio or it was an audio book. And we listened to it together for about six months. And everything in our life has changed. And you know, it's not some magic hocus pocus, but there's the pow- that power of positive thinking and always believing there's a there's a way. A lot to be said for that. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Some parts of it is a little hokey, but uh, but the underlying, I, I completely agree so, with you. The underlying, you yeah, know, yeah. yeah everybody's uh, there's plenty of negativity out there. So so you know that negativity doesn't need your help at all, right? <laughs> Yeah, and it'll, it'll, and it'll seep in, and if you let the people seep in, I mean, we actually had an employee here that I've labeled the cancer, and it's if you let that creep in, it's it's going to be, it, it, may, it becomes almost impossible to eliminate it, so you have to just constantly think positive, think positive, I'm going to beat this, I'm the best that it's going to be, you know, it's, it's that mentality, and certain people, if they're weak-minded, I don't want to say weak-minded, but it's, you know, it's it's the... The the difference meant you know it's hard, negative it's hard minded. to explain, but it, 
Yeah, yeah, negative minded. That's a good way of saying it. If they're negative minded, it doesn't matter what you're going to, to do because they're so jaded and they're so believing that something is negative or bad or that you can't beat it. Right. And one of I actually took this saying from my business coach, which which is if I'm laying in bed at night and I'm thinking about you and we're not sleeping together, you, I don't want you in my company. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty fun. It's a pretty funny way of saying it. And you know, there's only one person I sleep with, and that's my wife. So there's you know I don't want to ever be up at night sitting there thinking about somebody. And if I am, you know, it's, it's one thing to be thinking about items in your business, but it's another thing to be thinking about a specific person in your company and that's that cancer piece. And it's really important to to think positive and eliminate all that crap from your life. Yeah, I completely agree. Hey, what's one of your favorite tools or pieces of technology that you've recently discovered, if any, that you'd recommend to other business owners and why? I think the one thing that I, that I do and uh, certain people struggle with understanding this as well is I've made my entire work environment that I can pretty much work from anywhere. Now the, the negative of it is that you're pretty much working from anywhere, but I find work fun and it's a passion for me and I take breaks and I take time off and I do that stuff on a structured, scheduled basis. Um, so I've made it so I can pick up and go work. And I work every Tuesday. In fact, yesterday, uh, every single Tuesday is my marketing day. I go off site and I go sit at Buffalo Wild Wings 10 miles from my company and I work all day from like 11 until about 6 o'clock on marketing activities and things I'm going to use to grow on, you know, working on the company directly related to that new idea generation, all kinds of different things. And so I think the specific technology would be making your environment so you're not stapled to a desk. Right. Walk, walking away and being free. Because one of the things that we've earned, all of us that are entrepreneurs, we've all earned the ability to get up and do what we want when we want. We just have to be willing to take it or be able to take it. I have a multi-million dollar attorney friend of mine. That guy can't leave his office ever. He's, I'm not even kidding. I, I think he's got a seatbelt on his chair and he can't leave. Right. He just, so he goes to court and he goes sits back at work and he, he's made his entire life that way. Yeah. So I, I think that, that to me has been really positive. Yeah, I, I did the same thing. You know, I, I built this, this golden cage that I couldn't get out of for years or I wouldn't let myself out of. And then finally, one day I just gave myself permission after I systemized my business. I gave myself permission to not go into the office anymore. And, uh, and so once I got those things set up, uh, you know, I, I changed my lifestyle and now, you know, I, I, I work, I wear sweats for a living, right? <laughs> Warm up mm-hmm. suits yeah. and, and I can work from anywhere, uh, er, anywhere in the world, and there's something incredibly liberating about that, right? It, it really is. I mean, I just, uh, I don't even know how to tell anybody that without having them experience it. The, the, the way for you to get up and actually do the things when you want, when you want. And I, I actually know a bunch of the crew over at the Buffalo Wild Wings, and they're like, you're like the only guy that comes in here on a regular basis and works. And I was like, well, it's because I, I do it for fun, and I, I it's, it's something that I do to... It's a it's a burnout controller, right? right? I think that's a that's a big big thing um, that it's hard to even to measure unless you see it and experience it because it's that burnout factor is definitely there for certain people. You know, they get so involved and so so freaked out about their company that they can't stand it. Yeah, I, I think it's as close to living life on your own terms as you possibly can get. Yeah. Um, what famous, I agree. I agree. what famous quote or, uh, would best summarize your belief or your attitude in business? Uh, I don't know that I have a specific quote. I, I, I look at a bunch of different things and I have, you know, I, I've read stuff from Colin Powell and Mark Twain and, uh, Abe Lincoln and, you know, there's all kinds of different things out there, but there's one motto that I kind of carry with me, which I think is a little bit different, but it's along the same lines. Hopefully you're okay with that. Sure. Um, and, and I think the, the one thing that I can probably give to people to talk about is there's life is more about, I, it's more about execution or success is more about execution than ideas. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I, I just kind of hold with me. I, I, somebody could have said it. I have no idea. Um, so if I'm not giving credit, I apologize. You could Google it and see. No, no, but no. Um, to me, success is critical the the getting to success ideas are great and people have them all the day all the time and every single day but so few people actually execute those ideas and sit there and are willing to take chance 
Right. But those that is, it, it becomes so critical. So success is about more about execution than ideas. Yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, one, one thing that I meant to ask you about before I wrap things up that I, I think would be instructive mm-hmm. and you hit it on, you hit on it early on. You had an employee embezzle a hundred thousand dollars from you. And you said that, that, mm-hmm. that, that, uh, caused you to change the way you did things. Now, I have a suspicion of how that caused you to change things, but can you speak on that for a minute? Cause I think that could be useful for other people. Well, it changed my life more than it changed me how to how to do things. I think you know one thing that that I, one place that I struggled in uh, was well, I don't I don't want to say struggle because I, I still I I trusted everybody at the time. I, I I never would say you can't trust anyone or you shouldn't trust anyone because if you can't trust anybody in life, you're never going to go anywhere, right? But um, it made me really sit back and, and think about what I was doing. That's more what I was in. I, I, I more of the stage that I was in because I, I wasn't in a scenario where I don't think I had, I was building myself a, a job. That's what at the time that, right. you know, I actually looked at it as a, as a big silver lining and, you know, there's, and it, and it forced me to, to have a plan and to have a structure more than anything at the time uh, coming out of it. I needed to have a plan. And, and now what we do in the company is I built all these systems and we really, really report on them. Like, uh, I can poke my head out, out of my office door here and look into the service department and tell you what our ticket response time is today. Cause we measure that very, very in depth. And you right. can look at, at certain numbers and things. So, so what it really forced me to do was it, it made me plan and it made me measure and it made me report. And then my business coach followed it up with, um, everything measured improves and everything measured and reported on improves exponentially. Right. Right. That's something that, you know, and I think Robin took that from somewhere else, but it's also, it's very, very accurate. And I watch my team now and we really, you know, we really focus on bonuses and metrics and I really try not to fail my new hires. Right. Right. Um, and, and I, and I think a lot of us also fail the people that we hire because we just assume they know what they assume we assume they're us. Mm, well said. <laughs> right. I'm I'm guilty of that. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I early right. on in my uh, in my first business, I, I've always had a natural ability to sell, and so I just thought everybody did. You know, and yeah. uh, when I first taught a couple of people to sell, I was like, "Come on, man, are All you right. dumb? You know what? Are, what are you not getting here?" And uh, you know, the person that was dumb was me because. I had not taken enough time to realize that not everybody is like me. And so my natural ease with some things uh, is not everybody else's natural ease. So so well said there. One thing that I wanted to yeah. highlight about losing the $100,000, not in having anybody embezzle, um, embezzle a, a large amount of money from me, but I, I did have you know a, a financial calamity where ultimately I lost everything and I had to completely start all over. And and uh, mm-hmm. although I'd been an entrepreneur and a very successful entrepreneur for many years, and what that taught me to do is I always looked at financials as an indicator of how we were doing. When I learned. To not only look at as, look at it as an indicator of how we're doing, but I also learned to drive my business entity from the purview or from the window of the financials, right? Mm-hmm. That's that, a good point. And that made me a much better uh, business leader when I made decisions based on that. So, what you know, when uh, accounting is trailing performance, it's it's or when accounting is used for performance, it's all trailing. But sometimes when you're steering this big ship, you need to know that there's an iceberg a hundred feet in front of you and you need to be able to yep. steer around it. And so I, I share that for the hopes that it's illustrative for everybody listening, that you need to pay attention to the, to the metrics like you talked about, but also the financial metrics of what's going on in your business. Cause a lot of times you, you will get warnings that things are happening or things are going on. And a lot of times you can avert that if you're paying attention to it. Absolutely. I, in fact, while the, 
the actual act itself was difficult. It would have been very difficult to change because the numbers were being, there was, there was one specific, basically what she was doing is she was taking money that was being paid to a specific vendor right. and going to the back of the checkbook and writing a check to herself for the same. So all the numbers equaled out, right? but um, it was, you know, it was, it was having a system of checks and balances in place to make sure that we're checking that. And you're, I could not agree with you more. And, and, you know, there's, Every one of us needs to improve with that, including myself to this point, because it's uh, one of our weakest points that I'm still struggling with is having a really, really solid controller internally. I have a I have a guy, and I'm not saying he's not solid, but he's an outsourced CFO for hire kind of thing. Right. And um, we, have an in, we have an internal billing person, and it's just uh, it's not something I'm good at, so I have to trust other people, and it's finding those right pieces. You know, and we're slowly putting them together, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, definitely a battle. Right, right. Excellent. Uh, well, great interview. How, do, how does uh, everybody connect with you? Uh, they can, uh, first thing you can do is you can just Google my name, Chris Weiser, W-I-S-E-R. That's, uh, that's very easy. I'm on Twitter, at Chris Weiser. Uh, Facebook, I am LinkedIn. I'm definitely there. So you just look at that. Otherwise, uh, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty easy to get a hold of. I answer all of my Twitter stuff immediately myself. Well, I shouldn't say immediately, but within within reason. But I do answer that, and I monitor manage that myself. So it's just at Chris Weiser, all one word. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Before we close the show today, I, I want to tell you something that may surprise you. No matter how old you are, and no matter how successful you are, fear still tries to creep back in and talk you out of your dreams. Or it tries to convince you to, to maybe scale them down so they're a little more believable, right? We all know that little voice inside with things like, mm, right now is not the right time, or who am I to achieve this, or there's smarter people than me that do this, or any number of the hundred plus, probably thousand plus versions of negative things that that little voice can say to you that wants to talk you out of achieving your greatness. And I want to tell you this because I, the fact that, it, that this negative voice, this fear is always there no matter how successful you are, at least in my experience, because I want you to become comfortable with operating in the presence of fear because it's never going to go away, although it does get easier. And then secondly, what I want you to do is I want you to sit down and write out your dreams. And this is tied to overcoming those fears. Now, I want you to be as specific and detailed as possible with exact amounts, exact timelines, everything, until there's absolutely no room for doubt exactly what it is you're dreaming of accomplishing. Now, once you get that down, I want you to go back and look at it, and I want you to make sure that it's unreasonable. And I want to be clear here. I didn't say reasonable. I said unreasonable. Dreams are unreasonable. Now, as you become crystal clear on these things, you'll become much more single-minded, and there will be much less room for fear and doubt. This is how you overcome fear, by having desires that are stronger and then going after them. Over time, you'll come to realize that the majority, meaning 95% or maybe even 98% of fear, is just an illusion. Think about that. This is Travis Lane Jenkins signing off for now. To your incredible success, be sure and take some time for yourself and write that down. Take care, my friend.